Hey everyone, welcome to Wildlife Inspired. I'm your host, Scott Keys, and in today's video, we're gonna talk about Photoshop's generative fill feature. Not just how great it is, but some of the downfalls and how you can spot them right after this. Now, a lot has been made of Photoshop's generative fill feature. This is an AI technology and artificial intelligence that's now integrated into Photoshop and it's probably one of the biggest breakthroughs they've had in years. The, the technology is very powerful. It can do some incredible things. We often think about things like expanding a canvas or adding pixels into an image that weren't there originally, maybe removing objects very simply. And one of the advantages of this software is, or, or this feature of the software is it's very simple. It doesn't take a lot of learning. It doesn't take a high degree of skill. You simply need to select areas and ask generative fill what to do and the artificial intelligence will do the rest. Let me show you some examples of how I could insert a butterfly into an image of my wildlife photography. I could make an area much bigger than it originally was. I could even take two different frames and stitch them together using generative fill. Now the technology is very, very powerful. And what I generally hear about is how great this is for improving workflow. Now, there's an ethical component of this that I'm not going to address, which is the integration of artificial intelligence into what we call photography. And is it still photography? What I want to talk about is actually the results and how generative fill isn't quite there yet. So it does a lot of great things. But when you're watching a YouTube video on how perfect it is, what they don't often do is show you some of the detail. Now, I'm not a pixel peeper, so I don't zoom in on every pixel every image that I have and look at, at the pixel level. But if we just take a little closer look at generative fill, I'm going to show you some of the flaws of this technology and how you can spot them. Now let's take a look at this first image that I brought up as, as an example. And we're going to do a very common task, which is to remove an object. Maybe we call this distraction removal for as a bird photographer. Sometimes I want to take out a stick, for example. Now I'm simply going to select the lasso tool. You'll see it over here on the left side. And I'm going to make a selection of the object that I want to remove. And in the past, there are other tools that could do this. For example, the clone tool. There's another one called the remove tool. Um, but basically, we just use the generative fill tool because it's easy. Uh, it does the thinking for us. It very little skill involved. I simply learn how to use a selection tool like this lasso tool. I'm going to right click it. I'm going to hit generative fill. A prompt box is going to come up. And in that prompt, I can ask it, what do I want it to do? Now, if I'm just removing an object, generally, you don't have to put anything in there. I could put generate. And while that's processing, it's going to take about 15 or 20 seconds. I'll let you know in that prompt box, you could actually try to add an object in here. So if I wanted to add a butterfly to this image, I could have told it right there and it will do that. Now, that's not generally what I would use it for. I generally use it for a task like this. Distraction removal. When we look at it, this, I want you to notice the colors. The shades of colors are really, really well matched. Even that transition from dark gray to light gray seems to be very, very well done. So to the naked eye, first glance, boy, generative fill just removed an object without any thought, skill, just took care of it for me. 15 or 20 seconds and I'm done. Let's, let's look at a couple other examples though. Now, this is an image of a short-eared owl that I took, and I wanted to show you how you can use this artificial intelligence, this AI, not just to fill in an area of the image, but also to expand it. And we do this using the crop tool. So I'm going to select the crop tool. My original composition was down here. I would actually just stretch this out to my new composition. And I would generatively fill using this expand up here. So you make a selection. It's got background, generative expand, content aware. Now this, quite honestly, this isn't a tough fill. This is a pretty easy one for Photoshop to recognize what needs to go there. Pretty much just filling in some colors, a little bit of pattern. And after that generative fill process, it looked like this. Let me give you a little tougher one. Now, this is an image of a northern harrier. And in the field, I wanted to capture that really nice light that was up at the top. But in doing so, in trying to achieve as much of that as possible, I pushed the bird to the bottom of the frame. Now, I could have Photoshop take care of this composition for me by adding pixels at the bottom and to the right. So if I go to that crop tool, and I simply take the original composition and stretch it down into the right in this case and hit generative fill, what I'm going to end up with is something that might look like this. And the interesting thing about generative fill, it gives you a couple of options to choose from. 
and you will get a different option every time. In this case, it looks really, really good. So I've, I've showed you some of the practical applications, but I told you, what do we look for in terms of the problems of this? Let me dig in here a little bit tighter. You can see a line there. Generative expand has created a little bit of a problem for me. At first, it looked really, really great, but it hasn't perfected matching noise patterns. Let me take one more look. We had this house finch that, again, to the naked eye, looked really, really good at first. And then I want to look a little closer. So I'm going to zoom in on it. Oh, my goodness. I mean, look at this. It is just obvious. And while very, very powerful tools, they are far from perfect. While they will generally match the larger image, um, they'll match the, the context of the image, they will almost always fall short in matching the noise patterns of those original images. Now, there are a couple tips that you can try. And the first tip is you can try your noise reduction at different stages. I would suggest when doing this, you use noise reduction. It greatly improves the ability to blend the generative fill or generative expand areas with the originals. Now, my favorite noise reduction is Topaz Denoise or Topaz Photo AI. I've been using it for years. I'll put a link down in the description if you're interested. I've been an ambassador of theirs for years. It's a great product, very easy to use, by the way. The second thing is, if you're using this, you're going to need to peek a little bit closer than normal. The last thing in the world you would want to do is edit an image and send it out and post it publicly or print it. And then realize once you got that print back that there were some errors created by the use of generative fill. So while a very powerful tool, it is far from perfect. And generally, the imperfections are, come, are going to come from its inability to match the original noise patterns or even patterns that were created from a noise reduction process. And that's the video that I've got for you today. A little bit different for me on my wildlife photography channel, but I do like to touch on Photoshop and Lightroom and some editing techniques once in a while. I do a lot more of this over on my Patreon channel, so I'll put some information down in the description. If you're curious, go ahead and check that out. I'd ask you to subscribe to the channel. I've got some playlists down there. I do a lot of different videos. So check out the playlist down below. Hit the bell for notifications. And as always, I hope we can continue to find inspiration in wildlife together. Okay.